The Photo Vault. A journey into vernacular photography, archives and photo books. Hi and welcome to this episode of The Photo Vault. There are some people in this world who have done it all, it seems. When you read their CV, you just think, wow, there's something to look up to. I had the pleasure to chat with Lucy Sand, a Belgian-born American writer and educator, but also artist, who has brought us very important and insightful books on photography, such as Evidence or Folk Photography. She has also written on history and is soon releasing a memoir. Lucy is a very humorist collage maker with a ton of irony. On her website are works that you can feast your eyes on. In the interview, we have a few references that you can find links to in the text section of the podcast. And at the end of the interview, at about minute 34, you will have my brief summary on the conversation. Okay. Okay. Good. Ready to go. Lucy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Lucas. Glad to be here. I was uh, thinking that we dive deep into your relation to the book. Mm -hmm. Not only the photo book, but the book as a medium. Mm -hmm. Because you, as a college student, worked in the Strand Book in New York. After college. After college. Mm -hmm. I mean... I you... worked in the libraries during college at Columbia. Yeah. Okay, so it goes, even, it goes even earlier. I mean, you also reviewed books mm -hmm. as a professional reviewer. Um, and of course, you worked on many, many books, whether as a writer, an author, but also you create visual artworks. So you have, you have a, a, a really, I think, quite unique, deep, deep insight into what the book is as a medium. Mm -hmm. Was that already something you were interested in um, as a teenager or even younger, the book as such? Well, I come from a working class family in Belgium and we emigrated when I was Well, the first time I was five, the second time we, because we went back for a second time, I was seven, et cetera. Um, and I was an only child and I was often lonely and isolated. It took me years to get to know people in America and um, books were my friends. And this sort of ran in the family because my father, who left school at 14, you know, to go work in factories um still was a great reader and when we moved to the united states we had nine crates of belongings that accompanied us and one of them was filled with books um so there were always french books around the house and then i started reading english and i remember that uh well a really major event in my life was when in my town in new jersey where i grew up there was an annual book sale some benefit and there are rooms and rooms and rooms of old books and i would be crawling under the tables i would be looking at everything um and um i de quickly developed a taste for oh books that seemed to come at me without any context like people's reminiscences of um nightclub life in the 1930s which i knew nothing about you know and it just immersing myself in completely unknown landscapes um and um you know i mean i didn't read children's books really i read um you know comic strips from belgium i subscribed to spirou for 10 years of my childhood To give you some references here, Spirou is a Belgian comic strip character and protagonist in Spirou and Fantasio and Le Petit Spirou, a very classic cartoon in the French language sphere. I had an aunt and uncle who were news agents in a small town in Belgium, and they would periodically send us packages. So they would send me, for example, the, um, the French teenage magazine Salut les Copains, and they'd also send my father a lot of Cyril Noir the crime novels, and my father hated crime novels, so I took them. Um, and, um, and then in English, um, I st started commuting to high school in New York City, and I started going to the beatnik bookstores, you know, and I was uh, immersing myself in avant-garde poetry, and all this stuff was going on simultaneously, right? I was reading Spirou and reading William Burroughs at the same time. Um, and books were a major 
assistance for me in uh, acculturating myself to the United States, but also keeping a foot in Europe. And, um, you know, and again, as I said, I mean, I didn't really have very, I had almost no close friends until I got to college. So books were my friends. And, um, and I remember that my childhood bedroom, I had a big bookcase and I thought, will I be able to keep having bigger bookcases as I grow up? And yes, now I have a gigantic library in my basement, you know, uh, but yeah, it was natural for me to get jobs that involved books. And uh, all, as I say, I, I worked in the library all through my college years at Columbia, which is a very, very good library. Um, and then I worked at the Strand Bookstore. And then I worked at the New York Review. And in between, I worked briefly for a photographer who took pictures of authors for book jackets. And then I went to the work, work for the New York Review of Books. And that was my last full-time job. And, and that was, what kind of books did you review? Was it literature only or? Well, when I worked for the New York Review of Books, I was just an employee. I was, you know, doing jobs that had, I wasn't reviewing books mm. for them. But I started, I, I cold, cold submitted um, a review my second year there, having never published anything professionally. I published things in little magazines, but this was the first time I was approaching it as a profession. And they published it. And now I've been writing for the New York Review of Books for 42 years. I realized that when I appeared recently in the 60th anniversary issue, I started in their 18th year, you know, so it's a long time. Um, and I reviewed books. I don't really do that much anymore. Now and then I'll review a book, but um, but it was just an easy way to make a living at that time. You know, it didn't pay much, but I lived in cheap apartments. So it was possible to live cheaply until sometime in the 1980s or 90s. Do you actually get paid nowadays reviewing books? I feel like this is, this is, a. Uh, it feels from another time in a way. No? Yeah. Well, at the time, you know, then you could write a short review for a newspaper and they pay you a couple of hundred dollars, mm. which was okay because that was my rent, you know. Now there are very few places and they want generally longer essays. So I write for the New York Review, sometimes for the New York Times book review, sometimes for Harper's. And then it, tends to be longer pieces and you know it pays a bit more but you know given the uh devaluation of everything it's not enough um but um you know it's only once in a while when something means something to me a book or an author means something to me and i i feel that i have something extra to say whereas when i was young i was just reviewing anything that came my way yeah you know I mean, you have a quite an interesting path in the sense that you have all this expertise in, in the written word, but you also have an expertise in visual language. Mm -hmm. So you actually have an expertise in these two, two forms of how we, use, how we use language. How did that interest in the visual world come about? Or where, where did that start? Well, that started first. Mm -hmm. And when I was a child, I wanted to be an artist. Um, part of my problem is that I'm partly colorblind. <laughs> um, okay. But, um, but it was really a decision that I had to make when I was 18. Am I going to go to university or to art school? And I got big scholarships, so I went to university. But when people ask me a question like this, I always say, and I believe it's true, the thing that made me a writer was English as a second language. Because French I got at my mother's breast, you know, and it's sunk deep into me. And it took me years because I only went to school in Belgium up to third grade. So I didn't understand grammar or spelling or any of that stuff. Whereas in English, it's completely the opposite. I learned it from the printed word. And uh, furthermore, um, almost any basic word in English, I can remember my first encounter with it. And sometimes it was on the side of a truck. And sometimes it was on the label of a candy bar. You know, so it's... I. It's a very synthetic uh, relationship I have with English, but I have a feeling of mastering English, whereas I don't feel they'll ever feel that way about French, even if I come to live here and readapt it for daily use. Because English, you know, I, I grew it in my laboratory.
So in a way, you also have visual connections to the way you actually learned that yes, language. Yes, absolutely. Say, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm very good proofreader because a word just doesn't look right if it's not properly spelled. You know, it it hurts my eye. Yeah. And I think it's very different if you're if you're. I mean, that as you say, that bilingual ability to rethink a language because it doesn't come natural to you right away mm -hmm. you have to rethink the world also in its meaning you just you not just only use it i think that's that's it's a very powerful tool yes it is and i see it also i mean i'm always fascinated by the way um, english is not my native language but how english is used on the indian subcontinent and how indian authors use that language so eloquently oh yeah i mean oh, yeah i mean some of my favorite literature comes out of india because yeah. it's just it's just a different world of how and i love spoken indian english mm. the the emphases the rhythms it's beautiful i was thinking about this part of our conversation and played in my head a list of authors whose first language was not english yet wrote in english like Nabukov, who was Russian, but wrote Lolita in English, or Joseph Conrad, who was Polish, but wrote Heart of Darkness in English. Actually, I recently learned that Jack Kerouac, such a quintessential American writer, did not learn English until he was six. And of course, as mentioned, Indian writers, such as the incredible Aryundati Roy, or Amitav Ghosh, and many others. And, uh, you know, in my native town, Bellevue, um, Probably the leading scholar in the 20th century was a man named Jean Wisimus, who nobody outside Valvier has ever heard of. Um, but he wrote a book presciently in 1919 called L'Anglais, Langue Auxiliaire Internationale. And predicting, you know, he was saying, because remember, before World War I um, was the high point of Esperanto and Volapük and all those things. And he's saying, why, why do we need an artificial language? We already have English. And lo and behold, a hundred years later. Yeah. Yeah. Look where we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and how, what's your relation to photography? Because, I mean, obviously this is a photo-based podcast and photography has been a, a, a strong influence for mm -hmm. you. And of course, also within your professional life. How did that come into, into being for you? Well, again, it had a very specific origin in my local public library. Um, they had a series of time life books on photography that came out in the 1960s. And there was one volume called Documentary Photography, which was, you know, there was the Civil War photographers, this is American, right? The Civil War photographers in the West. And, but then you get into the FSA, Walker Evans, Dorothy Lang, and it brought it up to Robert Frank and then, uh, Gary Winogrand, Diane Arbus, Lee Friedlander. And, um... It just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I've heard this from other people in the photo world. That book did it for a lot of people. And I began seeking out, especially Evans and Frank. They spoke to me immediately. And I, when I was a teenager, I took up photography. I learned developing and printing and all that and went out on some expeditions. And then I thought, you know, I'll always be a feeble imitator of Robert, Evan, Robert Frank and Walker Evans. So I should quit now before I embarrass myself. And so now I take pictures of my phone, big deal, but I stopped photo taking pictures. But um, I was always very alert to photography. And then in the late 70s, when I first started encountering vernacular photography, um, that changed my life. Um, there was a, an antique store on Broadway in New York City, just around 10th Street, that sold 20th century antiques. And that was brand new, that concept, because the, the regular antique stores sold 18th and 19th exclusively. Uh, so 20th century, but it was pop culture. And I found they had all these gang and crime photo photographs from newspapers from the 1920s and 30s. And I bought them all up. They were exciting. Um, and then a few years, around the same time, really, end of the 70s, there was a gigantic 24-7 wildcat flea market on Astor Place that lasted for a few years. Um, and you never knew what would turn up. One day I was walking through and this pickup truck pulls up and dumps its bed 
And it's a mountain of photographs. It's like 500 or more photographs that were just that just been deaccessioned by a syndicate called King Features. And many of them were photographs from the 20s, 30s, 40s. And I remember I only had one dollar, so I could only buy one picture. And it's a great picture. I still have it on my wall, you know. Um, and then another day, I was walking through this flea market, and I see a guy standing um, with at his feet, this huge guy, just standing there impassively. And at his feet are two small piles of postcards, but they're photographs. But they're photographs, postcards of the Mexican Revolution. And I bought his entire inventory for 10 bucks. And then I started looking for these photographic postcards everywhere. I was already familiar with the photo postcard in a sense because my baby pictures were printed on postcard stock. And that was very common in Europe. The American history is completely different. And I could not believe my eyes. I mean, is, are these real? I can think. But yeah, they are. Um, and in fact, years later, I had a great opportunity to, uh, I was given three days in the New York Times morgue. The morgue being a term for where newspapers at least used to have the depose all their used material. You know, and in the Times morgue, for example, you'll see that they cut out stories, rolled them up, and put them into the little square boxes. And there are just thousands of these. But they also have all these filing cabinets and are nothing but photographs. And um, they're indexed according to a weird system. And I just happened to find the one on the Mexican Revolution. And almost the entire folder is photographic postcards that were mailed directly from the front to the New York Times offices. Wow, okay. And what in your, I mean, these collections, what, what happens to them besides you enjoying them? Are you Are you like an avid collector that, that archives or you structure or you this, this is for your thinking process or? or? Well, I mean, I was, um, you know, I was just buying all kinds of crap because it cost nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was buying these pictures for 10 cents, 25 cents. Uh, a dollar was like, you know, an expenditure. Um, and I just amassed all kinds of stuff. But the photographic postcard really interested me. And then a book came out on the subject. And I realized it was um, the first book on the subject in English, uh, Prairie Fires and Paper Moons by Andreas Brown and another guy. It came out in 1980, I think. And um, Andreas Brown owned a bookstore in New York called the Gotham Book Mart. It was very important. And he had a huge collection of postcards and many photo postcards. And uh, that you know, launched me. And every time I got a chance to leave New York, I'd go to um, antique stores, antique barns and junk barns. And, you know, in those days, they were just like piled up. They'd be in big salad bowls or, you know, just dumped into cardboard boxes. Um, and, um, and at some point, I started thinking, you know, this has got to be a book. I mean, this is second nature to me. Anything really important is going to become a book. And so I decided, okay, I'm collecting these things. I'm going to write a book. And then when, once I've written the book, I'm going to stop collecting. And that's exactly what I did. I put out the book Folk Photography in 2009. And that's where my collection ends. Every once in a while, I see something, you know, um, and cannot help myself buying it. I still... When I can afford them, I still collect like spirit photos. That's, you mm -hmm. know, one enduring fascination. But um, by and large, I have just stopped collecting. It's, it's too expensive. And also, the fact is that I love the thrill of the chase and finding things under rocks and finding things in barns and, you know, and photo postcards winding up in the unlikeliest places. And now it's, you know, you pretty much have to go to a dealer's. And that's just like... That's, that's not wild. That's domesticated. It doesn't interest me that much. Just to add here, spirit photography or ghost photography started in the late 19th century. It's a fascinating subject in itself. I will add a link to the podcast description. So you would say that vernacular photography in a way made you a reader of photography. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating because I think very often people come from the very from the very opposite end. Mm -hmm. They look at high-end photography first. They look at the arts. They look at maybe advertisement. And, and that's what's interested them. And then maybe 
long circle yeah, yeah. Up with the kind of stuff that gets discarded. And I started writing about photography a completely different way, which is that I, in 1991, I published a book about New York called Low Life. And my publisher said, you know, you've got to find illustrations. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea writers supplied illustrations in those days. And um, I made a, a lot of mistakes. I haven't repeated since, you know. Uh, for example, I now know that possession is nine-tenths of the law, you know, for and it's much cheaper to buy pictures than it is to pay permissions. Um, but I was going through all the collections I could find in New York City, and I went to the Municipal Archives, which is across the park from City Hall, and I was looking through various microfilm reels of not interesting photographs, and one of the curators there said, have you seen our crime and police collection? No. And they wheeled out a cart with all these ring binders with, filled with copy prints made from glass plate negatives that they had found under a staircase when the police department moved out from the old headquarters to the new one. And uh, they cleaned out everything, but they forgot what was under the staircase. So the archivist got there and made copy prints of these plates, and they were amazing. And I couldn't believe them. I thought I thought they were the work of a un hitherto unknown master photographer. You know, it's somewhere between like Alger and um, and I don't know who Ouija maybe. Um, and uh, I knew. I used some in my book, but I knew I had to write a book about these photographs, which came out the following year in 1992. It's called Evidence. And Evidence had an impact on the photo world. And very soon I was getting job, you know, I was getting all kinds of work writing about photographs, which I had never contemplated before. And it really became a second career for me. And um, and then I went on. I just retired in May from I taught writing in one semester and alternating semesters with history of photography at Bard College in New York State. And um, I think I've kind of retired from writing about photography pretty much now. But I did that for a long, long time. And it was r amazing. I mean, it was a complete education for me. I really got deep into the history of photography, high and low. And when you say retired, is it is it out of out of interest? Do you think the what you see now with photography is, well, is not of, of, of interest so much to you? Yeah, or? The, I was never, you know, I was always more interested about in anonymous photography, photography of the past than in the current thing. That's one thing. But also I'm getting old and I want to concentrate my my strengths and Really, I only want to write books now, pretty much. So the written word has a bit more interest. Well, it just I have more control. And also, you know, the thing is freelancing, writing about photography means freelancing. I might write a book about pho pho photography at some point. Another one, I've written three. Um, but, um, but freelancing means constantly changing topic, having to reorient myself. And that's very fatiguing, you know, repositioning my lens and reconcentrating my focus is it just a, has become a, well, you know, I was younger, I was much more flexible. Now to become old and calcified, it's a struggle. All right. And for you, I mean, because, because it's also an interesting history that, that you then actually would teach history of photography mm -hmm. and, and that became so ingrained actually in not only your thinking process, but mm -hmm. the way you communicate and the way you educate. Right. Was vernacular a part of that too? In the way oh, yeah, teach? absolutely. I never made the distinction. In fact, I would, but I would, the way I handled it is I would teach a series of classes and ro rotate them over the years. So there was the portrait, cities and photography, landscape and photography, um, the photo book I did for a while. Um, there are a couple of others I can't quite remember, but um, yeah, there was one actually, one that was entirely about vernacular photography, but then the others all had vernacular photography within them as well. Well, because this is, I would say, quite unusual in the general spectrum, because even 
me who studied photography maybe 20, 15, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, 18 years ago, vernacular was not in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. like zero. This was in the UK. Right. This was not there wasn't. There. No, yeah. absolutely not. And I was helped a lot by the fact that my um, my boss, um, the head of the department, was the photographer Stephen Shore, and who had a long-standing interest in vernacular photography himself, and had mounted shows of it when he was young. Well, it must have quite changed in that sense because I mean, look where we are now. Yeah. Uh, we we just inaugurated this vernacular social club, and mm -hmm. uh, you were kind enough to, you know, officiate that with us. And and yeah, we're we're definitely a, a different step. What that step means, we 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 don't know exactly because we're still trying to find a space in a way for this vernacular photography. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. Um, but I mean, at the same time, I can see how remarkably it's grown in the twenty first century. You know, but, but, you know, consider this. In the United States, the first gallery to open that sold photographs, the Limelight Gallery, opened in the 1960s. There was no photo galleries before that. I mean, photography was sold in other galleries, but as a minor side thing. Um, the Metropolitan Museum of, New of Art in New York did not have a photo photography department until the mid 1980s. The Museum of Fine Arts in Boston still doesn't have one. It still subsumes photographs under prints. Um, you know, so, and the photo book industry really waited for uh, digital scanning before it could really become a thing. Because if you look at photo books made before that were either very luxurious or total crap. Um, and that made a big difference, I think. And just visual hunger became a whole new thing. Um, and people wanting photo books of every possible kind of thing you can imagine. I mean, now, you know, you can find books of photographs of phenomena that you didn't even know were phenomena, yeah. you know? Cat toe fetish, or I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, no ab ab absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the question for me is also in... With this enormous production that we have, photography, photo books, I mean, reproduction is so much easier. We have so yeah. many printing techniques. Everybody can online press a button and the book comes out. Yeah, yeah. The question is also for me, what if this will stay? Because we always have in the history of anything, these enormous waves, yeah. these ups and downs. Uh, uh, so for me, it's the question, yeah, what, what, what if that will stay alive and, and persist? Well, you know, it, it will, but it there, it will undergo an eclipse. Everything does. It may not be for 20, 30 years. If that even is, will be a world in 20 or 30 years, of course. But, um, but it'll happen. You know, um, painting will take on a new meaning at some point. You know, it's, it's cyclical and we can't, we can predict it in the most general way, but how it will happen, what its manifestations will be, we cannot foresee at all. I guess it's also with this vernacular social club that we're just creating. Mm -hmm. It's of sorts to, because it's founded by people who have worked around the vernacular for quite a while. Yeah, I think that club is also a part to keep that discussion fresh mm -hmm. or to keep a new, to create a new energy around the vernacular so that many new voices can come in. Because I think the way we've discussed vernacular is very America or Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm fascinated. I want to know more. I mean, what I've seen of Indian popular photography, for example, is spectacular. And I want to see a lot more of it. Uh, Japanese, Chinese, yeah, I mean, anywhere. Um, you know, every culture has its own tinting methods, has its own styles of printing, you know, just a million things. You, uh, its own ritual uses. It's, it's, it's a whole, you know, I was going to say a whole continent, but it's a whole universe, really. Yeah. If, if, you, if you do another photography book, what would it be on? Is there any any thought you have or any, anything you haven't really explored or you think like, oh, this could be something worth getting into? Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, for a long time, I was going to do evidence, too, because I bought a lot more police evidence. I bought from police evidence photographs in the 1930s on eBay and tons of them. But I wrote the text and it was 10 pages 
And so I put that in one of my collections, mm -hmm. I, you know. Um, so I don't know, because I, since I don't really collect anymore, um, I, I haven't really developed any new fascinations. And, you know, in the meantime, like, for example, I'm fascinated by spirit photography. I've written about it, but I never write a book because there's already 25 right. books on the subject. You know, it's every, t uh, you know, by the time I think of something, somebody's already done the work. So, but you have these, you have these drawers, these dead end drawers where you have uh, like text written like that and they're just... No, no, I, I reuse everything. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I have very little that's written that hasn't been published. I have a lot that's published that I will never republish. I mean, for you, who's someone who worked so much on, on, on reading the world in different ways, I mean, mm -hmm. teaching yourself a language with sort of a, a visual background in a way to master the language in your own way, and mm -hmm. that would lead you to also writing literature and, and educating yourself in a visual language and then becoming an educator. What would be to maybe some of the younger listeners who are interested in, you know, rethinking the world through their own eyes, their own words, their own languages, what would be sort of an advice you could give? Well, just keep your eyes open, you know, and never, don't stick to the old categories. You have to find your own, um, you know, it's the thing that will hit you that you haven't really thought about too much. It's probably, you know, some online phenomenon that I don't know about because I'm too old. Um, you know, there's um There's all kinds of stuff out there on the internet that's really unharnessed. Um, one thing, you know, my my laptop wiped all my contacts, but I used to have, and I cannot retrieve them because I can't remember what they were called. There were all these photo dumps on the internet, and there was like one in particular that was, um, it went, it covered like a very wide range of time. It was started from the 70s, until maybe the present and it was basically like teenagers getting wiped out teenagers on drugs teenagers doing extreme stunts teenagers driving cars at 120 miles an hour and it was all these photographs and some of them were digital and some of them were scanned you know hard copy um but th there are things like this they do exist on there and you know it's a we're how did they happen? Are they public domain? Um, you know, do, you know, there are people who scrape Netflix and they put together, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. And, um, and I'm, I, you know, I'm not sufficiently, I mean, I guess if I knew what was out there, I'd be pursuing it myself. So young people go for it. Perfect. Super ending. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. My pleasure. What a pleasure it was to get to know Lucy Sant, her history and thoughts on books and the vernacular. I was certainly impressed by her elaborate visual explanation of why she became a writer and a good one too. The thing that made me a writer was English as a second language because French I got at my mother's breast, you know, and it sunk deep into me. Whereas in English, it's completely the opposite. I learned it from the printed word. And uh, furthermore, um, almost any basic word in English, I can remember my first encounter with it. And sometimes it was on the side of a truck, and sometimes it was on the label of a candy bar. You know, so it's, I, it's a very synthetic uh, relationship I have with English, but I have a feeling of mastering English, whereas I don't feel they'll ever feel that way about French, even if I come to live here and readapt it for daily use. Because English, you know, I, I grew it in my laboratory. Lucy's fascination for books started as a young child and later working in the university library, the Strand Bookshop in New York, and then moving on to becoming a critic. And I think it's wonderful to have the capacity to be a critic, yet a maker as well. She's bringing out a new book titled I Heard Her Call My Name, A Memoir on Transition. That's Penguin House, to be released next year, 2024 in February. The description reads, An iconic writer's lapidary memoir of a life spent pursuing a dream of artistic truth while evading the truth of her own gender identity until, finally, she turns to face who she really was. It is, as I guess you guessed by now, her transition from 
Luc to Lucy. Thank you for listening to the Photo Vault. Subscribe and follow us for future episodes. Lucas Birk says au revoir. <laughs>